thank you for being here tonight. My name is Maria Fernandez and I'm the coordinator for the WCSD Parent University. Tonight's important topic is keeping your kids safe and healthy during the school year. I would like to introduce our panel of speakers. We have Margaret Allen, Director of Student Health Services, Mari Hartman, Clinical Services Director, also from Student Health Services, Victor Charbandi, Executive Director in the Strategies Office. Next slide, please. We also have with us, with us tonight, Catherine London, Counseling Coordinator, Roger Button, Counseling Specialist, Trish Schaefer, Coordinator for Social and Emotional Learning and Behavioral Wellness. Jana Moyer, Social and Emotional Specialist. Our panel of experts has nearly 100 years combined working in the Washoe County School District on behalf of kids and families. We're also, we're excited to have them here. We are going to start with Margaret and Marie from Student Health Services. Good afternoon, parents and families. Welcome back to a new school year. My name is Margaret Allen. I'm the Director of Student Health Services. I oversee all of the uh, school nurses. We want to talk to you about your students coming to school this year and having a successful year. Health begins in the home. We want to make sure that you are keeping your students home if they're sick, if they're showing any signs of uh, sickness at all. We do have a self-screening tool that after my clinical director, Mari, uh, shows you um, how to put on masks, um, I will go over a, a self-screening so that you are aware of what we expect you to do prior to sending your children to school. This is something that we hope everybody will do. If a child comes to school that is ill, we will have to send them home. And so we prefer that you keep them home when it ever, whenever possible. Um, this is for parents, this is for employees as well. If we're not feeling well, we want to say stay at home. Um, we do have some things that are mandatory and um, Mari Hartman is going to demonstrate the use of face coverings. Um, and then I will end with going over the screening tool for how parents are to screen their children prior to sending them to school every day. Mari, I'm gonna hand it over to you. So with face coverings being mandatory, um, there are several different types of face coverings available. Um, several families um, and several staff members have a face covering which is uh, could be homemade or cloth face covering. You could also have a face covering um, which would be um, a little more uh, surgical, which is what I have here. Um, Face coverings, um, putting it on properly um, will help protect the student as well as um, who the student is around. So we want to ensure that you're holding your face mask by the strings. You're going to pop it over your ears. You want it to um, be secure around the nose and no openings here. You want it to be secure around the face. Thank you, Mari. Um, again, we will accept any type of face covering. Um, and if your child can't wear a face covering, um, we will need a doctor's note in order to um, make sure that your child um, has a medical reason for not being able to wear a face covering. The face covering will help protect uh, the teachers and other people around. And when we're all wearing a face covering, we're protecting the other person. Uh, we will have some face coverings available if your child soils or uh, forgets their face covering, but these are limited. And so we are hoping that 
you will be creative and supplying face coverings that are appropriate for your child. If you're having trouble deciding this, uh, maybe your child's having trouble with a certain face covering, our school nurses can help you in finding something that works. I'm going to go over the self-screening tool. If you'll um, advance these slides, please. We have decided that every family should do a self-screening before they come to work or send their child to school. We want to know if anyone in the household has been sick. But we're, we're particularly using this screen for an individual person. Has the child had any of these symptoms in the last 24 hours? We're looking for new or worsening respiratory symptoms. If your child has asthma, that a, a shortness of breath may not be a new symptom. Uh, vomiting and diarrhea is certainly something we would be concerned about. A fever of 100.4 or higher uh, is a reason we would not want you to uh, send your child to school. If they complain that they've lost their smell or taste, any of the symptoms such as sore throat, abdominal pain, nasal congestion, muscle pain or body aches, chills, headache, fever. There could be other symptoms that are new to um, your child, such as um, allergies or um, you know, having um, uh, reflux where your food is, is coming back up in your throat. The COVID symptoms can be very unusual. And so we want you to assess your child daily. Uh, check on them in the evening. Um, sometimes temperatures will not spike until the late afternoon or early evening. If you answer to, yes to any of those questions, your child says, yes, I have these, we want you to stay home. We want you to keep that child home. We want you to contact your child's school. If it's you, we would want you to contact your supervisor. If you need to, you can check in with the Washoe County Health District at their hotline, and it's listed on the slide. If you answer no to any of these questions, we welcome you to school. That means your child is learning ready and employers are ready, employees are ready to go to work. Next slide. If anybody in your household is waiting for uh, COVID test results, if they have been diagnosed as a COVID positive case, um, we sometimes they may not be tested. Maybe uh, the doctor just knows they have the symptoms. But if you've been told to isolate or you have symptoms, even if you haven't been tested, you may have COVID-19. We do not want you to come to work or school if you have tested positive or anybody in your family is positive with COVID. You can call the um, Washoe County District hotline, do a self-assessment, and they can do free testing. There's also other testing available throughout uh, the city. Again, if you are diagnosed or any member of your family is diagnosed with COVID, we want you to stay home. 10 days have to pass from the first symptom that you have. After those 10 days, we want 24 hours to where you are not having a fever, you're not having any symptoms, and you're not using uh, Tylenol. So it's gonna be 10 days plus one day to make sure that all those symptoms have passed and you're not using medication and all your symptoms should be uh, improving at the end of that 10 days. Everyone in the household who is not tested positive for COVID should isolate in the home for 14 days. Next slide. The reason that close contacts in the home have to stay isolated for 14 days is because that is the time, uh, 14 days is about the time where germs could be spreading. Somebody could be feeling really good one day and then two days later test positive. So we want to make sure that if you're exposed to it, you're staying home for 14 days, isolating, and then call the Washoe County Health District COVID hotline at 775-328-2427. 
You can also check in with your school nurse if you're uncertain about symptoms. Next slide. Mari went over face coverings. We want to start also with making certain that along with face coverings, you're washing your hands. We want you to wash your hands, have your child wash their hands before they put their mask on and when they take it off. Again, you can use any type of uh, face mask. It can be one that you throw away. If you're using one that is to be thrown away, you really need to throw it away every day. If you're using a face cloth, uh, face covering that like this one, and it can be made with any type of material, preferably that is um, thick enough to prevent germs from entering, make sure you're washing these daily. You can hand wash them with soap and water and just let them dry and be ready for the next day. Again, wash your hands after taking off your mask and uh, just keep washing your hands often. That is the conclusion of our presentation, and I thank you for listening. We're really excited to have your children back in schools. School nurses are available to help you and help your child if they're struggling with any types of issues with their face mask or illness when returning to school. Thank you. Next slide and next presenter. Hello, my name is Katherine Loudon. Um, I wanted to make sure that I let you know that we would be answering questions at the very end of the presentation for those of you who've asked questions. I coordinate school counseling and help support our school social workers and safe school professionals. And now that you've heard some information about how to keep your child and, your, and yourself medically and physically safe at school, and we're going to talk a little bit about feelings, actions, and thoughts. We're going to talk about the social, emotional, and behavioral ways that we can help keep our students safe. Next slide, please. In this uh, PowerPoint presentation that we're going to give to you, we're going to be talking about how you um, can acknowledge and accept the anxiety that's occurred and that it is very normal for people to be feeling anxious right now. And we're going to build capacity and community. We're going to talk about ways that you can help your child get ready for school next week. And, and these will not all be things that you have never done before. They'll be things like coping and practicing, looking at routine and structure. Next slide. Almost everyone that we know has been experiencing some form of anxiety. They have felt the pandemic over this last spring semester, and a lot of things have changed, including the way that we go to school, what's open and what's not open, the way that we can be close to one another. Um, sometimes things that we were able to do before we're not able to do now because of the pandemic, like being close to a loved one who is in a hospital or being able to go to a hospital to see a baby born. It's changed our celebrations. There's been grief and loss. We've also had the anxiety of a racial pandemic. Um, the American uh, Association um, of Psychology has um, called this a racial uh, pandemic. How many of our black communities and communities of color have suffered health consequences, post-traumatic stress disorder, and substance use as a, as a result of what has occurred. There's also a political divide and people are anxious about politics and the economy. They're anxious about immigration and the fact that many, uh, according to USA Today, 16.7 million people have at least one immigrant family member living in their home. A lot of things have been canceled for our kids, athletics, clubs, playgrounds, events, and it's very upsetting. Next slide. 
the place where a lot of these things come together is in our schools. That's where teachers prepare lessons and conversations about safety, about policy, about history, about learning, and, our, and where we as a community build resilience and skills. Whether you're learning online this school year or in person, that's something that you'll encounter. Next slide. Why is this year's return to school so important and anxiety so important is because we have gone without one another for so long. It's really important to build those attachments and that engagement to help prepare our students to address education and learning, to enjoy those rituals that schools bring about. It's important that because our schools were closed, that we demonstrate that self-care and the resilience that we as a community can do hard things, that we have things that we can control and that we have choices. Next slide. We also want to address um, and um, addressed trauma that may have occurred and grief and loss. As a parent, you had a lot of very difficult decisions to make. And one of the decisions that you made was whether or not your child was going to come to school in person or online. It was a unique family choice that you made and you may have struggled while you were making that choice and you did it based on your own values. It's important now at this point to find parents who are doing the exact same thing that you are, a support group for you, so that you have someone that you can talk to, to express kindness to yourself and others, someone who can help you through, these, through this time of uncertainty. The very first day back to school may not go um, perfectly because we are all human, but we will have this school year flexibility and grace and a kindness and a respect of one another. Um, we'll have that future focus and hope. Next slide. So there are some things that you can do. First of all, please read the reopening plan. Everyone keeps referring to the reopening plan. It's available in English and Spanish. Take notes, look at questions. There are things that are different. Um, look at where to go for help um, in that plan. Have a discussion with your child about role-playing scenarios. What happens if you lose your mask? Who do you talk to in class? What are some ways that you can understand how the buses look different or prepare in advance what you can do about learning from home? Next slide. Before school starts, practice getting up early the time that you have to get up. Prepare to have comfortable clothes. Practice hand washing in advance so that when you are at school, you can understand how that will look. Um, talk about how the classroom will look different and how adults will be um, acting or looking a little bit different in the school. Get, do your usual back to school ritual of getting the desk and the supplies and all of those things together. It helps build the excitement for the school year, whether or not your child is learning in person or online. Next slide. It's really important to empower your child to build capacity and confidence. Whenever someone is experiencing anxiety, they need to have answers. So ways that they can control what's going on and help themselves feel more comfortable. So one of the things that you can do is teach them grounding, which is where they really um, sit calmly in their chair with their feet on the ground. They feel what it feels like to be there in the chair. They take deep breaths and they can learn those deep breaths, um, such as um, deep belly breathing or ocean build breathing. They can give themselves a big hug, which we often call a clam hug. They can um, practice safety, have a look at distance, see what is exactly six feet apart and three feet apart. Teach them about transitions and show them things like ways to connect with one another. The teachers and schools have been working on lots of activities. So 
it's really important for them to um, know that there's going to be ways for them to re-engage and have fun at school. They might give an air high five or an air hug or send one another um, a heart or a, um, a fist bump or a elbow bump. And those things are really important to help our kids feel comfortable. Next slide. Okay. As a parent, if you're choosing in-person or distance learning, you can help your child feel at ease by having open conversations about what's worrying them and also letting them know it's natural to feel anxious at times. Uh, you can also help them deal with stress by uh, jokes at home, games, playing music, having meals together, you know, counting to 10 slowly, exercise is a good way to reduce stress, uh, practice visualizing safe places, people, things. Uh, and there's another little game uh, that you can play uh, called the five things activity. You just have them uh, name five things around that they can see around them, uh, four things that they could touch, three things you could hear, two things you could smell, and then one thing you can taste. Uh, this activity reduces anxiety and also keeps people in the present and kind of is distracting sometimes when people need to get their mind off of something. Uh, you can ask questions and, and talk to them. You can focus on the positive with kids. Uh, this is a chance, we're gonna go back to school, that they're gonna see friends, let them know this is the time they're gonna see the friends they've missed teachers. They're going to be learning new things. This is important. They can do something. This is a time we can grow as a family. Uh, next slide. Okay. Just every day is a little bit more. This is not something we can fix in a day. It's a process. Uh, every day, uh, we get a little more ready, a little more experienced, and we just have to take this one day at a time. No one's been through this before. Uh, next slide. Just to know uh, the school district and we're here to help you. Um, there's a website here, the family wellness website on the district website it has a lot of information to schools, but also uh, if you're a child or you need some help, you need some support, we're here for you. Reach out to your teacher, your counselor, social worker, safe school professional, or the school's principal. Next slide. So here's just a list of resources that we put together. Uh, and these are websites that can help you deal with stress, answer issues, how we can talk to kids about COVID uh, and dealing with anxiety. All right, uh, well, next up we have uh, Trish Schaefer, coordinator of social emotional learning and behavioral wellness and uh, Jana Moyer, Social Emotional Learning Specialist. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Hi, everyone. Um, as Roger just mentioned, I'm Jana Moyer. This is my 10th year in the Washoe County School District. I'm currently a Social Emotional Learning Specialist. Prior to that, I was a high school teacher who taught Spanish, English learners, and social emotional learning. I've also spent time teaching in Colombia, Argentina, and Uruguay. Thank you, Jana. Uh, my name is Trish Schaefer and I have the privilege of overseeing social and emotional learning, um, behavioral health and uh, wellness, multi-tiered systems of support and restorative practices. Um, great strategies here from our counseling experts. And so they gave you some different ways to help your child build routines and begin to um, normalize returning to school, whether that's hybrid um, in school all the time or distance learning. So Jana and I are going to share um, how you might help your child address the feelings that might come up as your child returns to school. We want to assure you that the Washoe County School District community of educators are centered on relationships with a foundation built on existing strengths from our Washoe County School District family and school communities. Your students will be experiencing curriculum to help them as they move through, but we're gonna give you some strategies. 
So regardless of whether your child or children are physically present in classrooms, engaging in distance learning, age three or 18, relationships will shape their learning environment and their social and emotional and academic growth. As I said, the teachers are equipped with curriculum and resources to help your child support their social and emotional development. And we wanna make sure that you are too. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about the importance of understanding and acknowledging the variety of emotions that you and your children may feel as we prepare for and begin the next school year. Um, we'll also cover some strategies that you can use to help your family identify and process emotion so it does not become too overwhelming and make sure that you have a fabulous start to the school year. Next slide, please. So all of us are born with some universal innate emotions. Here you see the five characters from the movie Inside Out, representing joy, anger, sadness, disgust, and fear. If you haven't seen this movie, we highly recommend it. Even though we all experience these universal emotions, we may express them differently. The first and arguably the most important part of addressing emotions in a healthy way is to be able to recognize and name what you're feeling in a given moment. Then you can work on understanding the cause and how to respond. Understanding where an emotion is coming from may be more difficult during this time. There may not be an obvious spark or an exact moment that sets off a feeling, but there is a constant undercurrent of stress and anxiety from the current situation. When we practice recognizing and understanding emotions in ourselves and others, we begin to navigate these emotions in a healthy way. This is particularly important when we are all wearing masks and the expressions on our faces may not be clear and visible. For this reason, identifying and naming our emotions and being willing to ask questions and speak openly has never been more important. Next slide, please. Once we've established the basic emotion we're experiencing, it's time to use a more precise word to label our feelings. Teaching our children to label their feelings helps ensure that we don't misinterpret cues or behavior and respond in unhelpful ways. For example, if your child is worried or anxious, but doesn't know how that feels, they may say they're angry or sad, or they might describe a physical symptom such as a stomach ache or feeling tired. One way to increase your emotions vocabulary is to practice labeling feelings. You can use pictures like you see here or play a game where you make a face and ask them to guess how you are feeling. You can even take selfies with your child and practice labeling them with a feeling word. For more of a challenge, try this while wearing a mask. Another version of this game involves choosing a phrase to say, such as, good morning, I'm glad to see you using different tones of voice, and then ask your child to label the feelings they hear in your voice. You can also be intentional about telling them how you feel, naming it and telling them how it feels for you. Sometimes we as parents try to hide our negative emotions. If we want our kids to learn to label their emotions, we can practice doing this with them. It is okay to let our children know when we're feeling sad or anxious so that they feel comfortable expressing difficult emotions with us. If you practice these strategies in a fun way when your child's feeling relaxed, they'll be more likely to learn to identify emotions that are intense and overwhelming. It's not the time to teach labeling emotions when your child is upset. If you haven't practiced ahead of time, it won't work. Next slide, please. So once you work on labeling and identifying your feelings, um, it's not just important for you to identify, but then you need to talk with your student about what is needed to comfort or address in the moment. Here are some sentence and stems on the screen. An example would be, what I'm feeling is overwhelmed because I feel like I have too much to do today. What I want to happen next is to get my list of to do's to a more manageable list. What I need right now is for someone to help me prioritize because it all seems important. That's pretty sophisticated for our little guys. And sometimes the answer when you work, when you talk with them, maybe I don't know, 
It's developmentally appropriate for many of our children, depending on their age, to truly answer, I don't know. It is always best to give them a little time to see if they can come up with the answer, but if they can't, try offering choice. It allows your child to remain in control and helps teaches them not only about identifying feelings, but healthy ways to cope when they are feeling overwhelmed. An example would be if you asked your child what they are feeling right now and they say, I don't know, you might wanna offer two choices. For example, are you feeling tired or sad? When you ask what they want to happen next, and they say, I don't know, or don't answer, you might offer, would you like time alone, or would you like to go for a walk and talk with me? What you need right now, a hug, or to go outside and play. This is a great tool that you as a caregiver can also use when you are experiencing a different emotion. Modeling this type of sentence stem and expressing what you are feeling not only helps you focus and stay calm, but it also helps model for your child what you hope that they will be able to do. This is a great coping skill because it helps us identify a feeling and what do I need to do so that I will feel better in a healthy way. Next slide, please. So as Trish was saying, once we've been able to recognize and label the emotion, we can think about how we regulate. You can think of regulating as the way you respond to or manage an emotional experience. We all have helpful and some unhelpful strategies for regulating our feelings. When we're responding to an intense emotion, such as rage, fear, or sorrow, we might yell, blame others, or eat a pint of ice cream. Are these regulation strategies helpful? Maybe in the moment, depends on what we're hoping to achieve. Are there other strategies that could be more beneficial to our health and our long-term relationships? Absolutely. To regulate our emotions effectively, we need to understand where we are and where we want to be. If we wanna change an emotion, for example, calming our nerves before we try something new, we can take deep, slow breaths, and practice positive self-talk. If your child is feeling both excited and nervous about starting the school year, remember, you can talk with them about what they should expect and help focus their attention on the things they can control. After we notice a strong emotion, we can take a moment to decide how we want to respond. By focusing on what's within our control, taking slow, deep breaths, or using other regulation strategies, we can reduce anxiety, that uncomfortable feeling of being nervous, improve the quality of our sleep, improve focus and overall wellness, and make good decisions. We can do all of these things with strategies that help us calm our nervous system. There are healthy and unhealthy strategies. One way to decide if we're responding in a healthy way is to ask ourselves these questions. Is that strategy helpful for achieving well-being? Is it helpful for building relationships? Or specifically with our children, is it helpful to achieve academic success? Taking some time to think about what strategies work for you in different situations can help you regulate your emotions with your children. And you can practice these strategies with them. I'm going to ask you now to consider a few healthy strategies that may work for you. Maria, could you please launch the poll? So families, if you could take a second to read through what you see here. If you were feeling anxious, which of the following strategies would work best to help you be more calm? And then go ahead and choose one or more that you think would be effective for your family or for yourself. Okay, it looks like, not sure how long we've got the poll up here for. We can have it until at least half of your um, attendees will respond if you would like. Fantastic, thank you.
right, for the sake of time. If you would like, I can end it now. Sure, thank you, Maria. Right. Maria, can you share with us? Fantastic. So we're able to see here that many respondents chose taking deep, slow breaths, talking to someone they trust, focusing on what we can control, and then positive self-talk. These are all great strategies for us as adults and they're great things for us to practice with our students. Next slide, please. Okay, so Jana shared a couple strategies that work well for you and we have another strategy here, the check-in. And over the past months, almost every person has experienced some sort of trauma, stress, anxiety, both from the racial and COVID pandemics. For some of our kids, they may especially feel more obligated to put on a brave face and say, everything is okay. If we think of our emotions and, a feel and feelings as this iceberg, the top is what we want everyone to see but the middle is what we might share with family and friends. And the bottom is what we maybe share with those who are closest to us or perhaps even keep to ourselves. We use this visual to remind you that sometimes when you ask your child, how are you? And they say, fine, or how was your day? It was fine, okay. There may be more going on. On the screen, there are a couple questions you should ask, and we're going to share a couple more on the next slide. Next slide, please. So empathetic conversations are a way that you can check in with your child. Empathy is defined as the ability to understand and share feelings of another. So on screen, you'll see some sentence stems that you can use to check in. In addition, you might also want to ask your child, what's something that made you laugh today? Or what's one thing that surprised you today? When you have a moment in the car or when you share a meal or getting ready, ask your child. You can also start to introduce the concept of gratitude or thankfulness. What's something that you are grateful for today? Make this a daily practice, even when you go to bed. It gives you a way to check in with them. You'll notice on the right hand side, we also have gentle reminders that you can end each talk with an aff affirmation. We put this here because we know for every criticism or correction that we offer a child, they need to hear five affirmations or pieces of specific praise in response from us. So each time you talk, think to yourself, have I given them five I love yous or great job taking out the trash and helping out today for every criticism. We know you're probably not going to remember the iceberg, but when your child says, I'm fine, or it's okay, remember that there may be feelings underneath that you, they want you to see, and use some of these tools to try to see how they are doing um, and check in. Next slide, please. So the educators at your child's school are working to support each student's social and emotional wellness and to build a strong classroom community. In Washoe County, every student will be exposed to lessons to build their social, emotional, and academic skills. Both adults and children experience feelings of loneliness. Knowing the future of social interactions are uncertain, we can get ahead of feelings of isolation by prioritizing relationships and making sure to find ways to keep both ourselves and our children connected with friends and family. Here in Washoe County, across the country and truly worldwide, we're living through history and it's uncomfortable. One thing we know is that we need community now more than ever. By paying careful attention to how we and our children feel, we can use healthy strategies to regulate emotions, stay connected with our friends and loved ones and better navigate these uncertain times. Next slide and back to you, Maria. We want to thank all of the panelists for sharing the great information. 
we have lots of questions. We have about 150 questions that our participants have today, and we're not gonna be able to answer all of the questions tonight. However, we're gonna save the questions that we don't answer, and we'll post the, um, the answers, and you will be able to see the answers um, via our website. We'll send you a link um, after this webinar, and it will have the resources that the panelists refer to, and we also add the link so you can see the rest of the answers for you, the questions that you had tonight. So with that, we're gonna start with the most frequently asked questions on the chat, on the Q&A se session that we had. And the first questions are for Margaret, Mari, or Victor. We had lots of questions on these ones, um, and here are the most common ones. Are face shields okay? And are we are going to allow neck, ga neck gaiters and banana bandanas? This is Margaret. I'm going to take a shot at it, and then Victor or Mari can jump in. We are not restricting the type of face covering. We just want to make sure that it is safe. Um, we prefer that your child. We prefer that your child wear a face covering that covers the nose and the mouth. Face shields do not offer the same protection that a mask does. And so we wanna make sure that um, people understand that. Uh, we have physicians in the community who uh, tell us all the time, even if my patient child has asthma, I would like them to, face, to wear a face covering. And so we would really like for you to practice and to experiment with the type of face coverings that your child um, would feel more comfortable in wearing. Um, it's important that they do this before they start school. A face shield can be worn in special circumstances, but we'd like you to work with your principal and school nurse if there are special needs. If your child has medical issues, we would like to know from a physician that states the reason this child can't wear a mask or a face shield, uh, and then the principal um, and others in the school will make this decision. But please consider very seriously that there are two options if you do not want your child wearing a face mask or they can't. You can do distance learning or you can send them to school. Um, we do require face masks. And so please um, uh, reach out to someone if you need help in um, deciding about the face mask. Victor, is there anything else? Yeah, thanks, Margaret. Uh, great response. I don't really have much to add other than please, I, I wanted to say thank you to all the families for being on the call tonight. This is super exciting to be able to engage with so many different families. And I would say that uh, face shields are never a substitute for a face covering. And so face coverings are the directive of our governor and they are required. So that's what I would add. Um, can I ask you a follow up question since now we know that face coverings are going to be required unless we have a medical condition. Uh, parents are asking, will, they, will there be a time during the day when kids can take their face uh, mask, uh, their face coverings off? Yeah, that's a great question, Maria. And I know Margaret or Mari could answer this as well. And the answer is yes. We, we know inevitably that many of our teachers and staff will need to take some deep breaths and remove their masks temporarily for certain uh, periods of the day. And those breaks, when, when students do remove their masks, they should notify their teacher or an adult that they would like to do that. And that, that teacher or adult should supervise that and at least keep an eye on that student. Um, and that student can temporarily remove their mask, but they need to be six feet or more away from any other adult or student. So it needs to be done in a very safe and orderly uh, fashion. And then after the student uh, removes their mask temporarily and takes some deep breaths and uh, feels better, then they should reapply that mask and then get, you know, continue on with their day. Great, thank you. Um, what about thermometers? Uh, our families are asking which one will be the most efficient one to have. This 
closest um, market and um, any type of thermometer that you can get, um, you know, either one that um, you want to put under the tongue as, as long as you have coverings and you're disinfecting that between uses. I think the easiest to use is a digital thermometer um, that has a, a light that you just don't touch the, the child's um, forehead. But um, any type of thermometer is acceptable. And we just want you to kind of keep an eye on that. Um, and, you know, again, probably a temperature is going to occur late in the afternoon or early in the evening. Your child may come home tired the first few days. Just monitor that because they are going to be um, back with other people. And um, so it could be something they're just tired. You want to make sure you're taking the temperature when they're relaxed and have not been running out in the heat um, or been, you know, in a hot shower. Um, so really any type of thermometer um, will work. And if you're struggling with what type, we can certainly uh, give you some references. We had a whole team this summer looking at uh, thermometers and we're happy to provide some references if necessary. Thank you. Uh, one of the most popular questions too is um, if a child tests positive for COVID-19, what will be next? If there's siblings in the household that will go to school, um, do they need to quarantine or can they go to school? And if they have to quarantine, uh, what will be the learning? Um, how are we gonna support them with the learning? This is Margaret again. Um, if a child tests positive, if they go to the Washoe County Health District and they test positive or if they go to another facility, the family is gonna get notified of the positive test. They should tell you, somebody is going to call you and tell you what to do next, but for now you should self-quarantine or self-isolate your family. That includes all siblings. If one person in the household is positive, the whole household is um, to self-isolate. We don't do that if a child or a parent is just sick and we don't know what it is. Uh, until we know that it's COVID, we don't isolate other members of the family. So initially we did start out with that, but um, the health district said, no, we want to make sure we have a positive case before we don't allow other members of the family out or other children in school. The isolation for a positive case for the person that has COVID is 10 days plus 24 hours without fever or any symptoms. If the other family members do not get it, they may be isolated for 14 days. Again, that goes back to the incubation period. But if the family is starting to see more and more cases, we definitely want to notify the Washoe County Health District so they can help us manage that. We want to keep that contained and um, minimize the spread to the schools. We want to keep our schools open. And the only way we can do that is when our families uh, self-isolate and uh, limit contact with others when they're sick and staying home when they're sick. Thank you, Margaret. Maria, the only thing I would add to what Margaret said really quick is that the same situation or scenario will probably play out if it's an elementary classroom and, and a child tests positive in an elementary classroom. Uh, the students in that room will likely be quarantined for 14 days. And the reason why it would occur in a, uh, in a household with siblings is because of something that we refer to as close contacts. And the way that you define a close contact is if a, uh, an individual had, um, a, had exposure to whoever tested positive for, uh, you know, within six feet for more than 15 minutes. Just wanted to add that as well. And Margaret, I need to ask a clarifying question on that. So if one child in a family has the symptoms of coronavirus, the shortness of breath or fever, the other children are allowed to go to school or they are expected to stay home? No, if the other children are not showing symptoms, they are allowed to go to school. We do um, encourage, you know, families to, you know, kind of take a step back and see, have we been out visiting relatives this weekend where my child could possibly have uh, been exposed to COVID? Um, but the children are not excluded until we have a confirmed case in the home. 
um, you know, that one child would be need to stay home until they get better, use the 10, 10 day rule, 24 hours. And um, again, there's different um, variations of the advice that we'll give. If a child is sick, say uh, with a sore throat or something feels like the flu and they go to a physician, the physician tests them and they have the flu and they test them and they're negative for the coronavirus, we're gonna sit, we're gonna look at different criteria as to when we can bring them back. We would not exclude them necessarily for the 10 full days. We want to look at if it's flu related or GI. But again, we are assuming that everything is COVID until it's proven that it is not. Okay. All right, so we have to do a couple questions for, um, for Catherine and Roger. Um, so the first question we have here that is most popular is, uh, will copying and behavioral health uh, and counseling be available for distance learning as well? So uh, yes, our, um, every student will have and be assigned a school counselor because so we will still have all of our school counselors. We've received over $4.5 million to maintain our school social workers, other mental health professionals and safe school professionals. And we will be providing counseling services and supports to students who are in distance learning as well as face-to-face. I would also say the counselors at each school, if they have kids on distance learning, they consider those that caseload and they're servicing those kids. Thank and, you. Go ahead, Trish. And from our office, our, we work very closely with our teachers who are supporting our students on distance learning um, to be sure that we're still working on those important um, relationship skills and identifying feelings and also academic growth skills. So time management and pacing and that kind of thing. All right, we'll do just the last question because I think a lot of people are wondering about this and it's about attendance. Trish, you probably can help us. Um, they want to know about attendance policy. If kids are sick with the COVID-19, um, what are the policy on that? Um, okay, well, I know that we are still requiring and encouraging all of our students to attend school. Um, that has not changed. If they're speaking specifically of the 10 day rule that was in place before we have lifted that understanding and knowing that students may need to stay home. However, school is still required and still mandated. So that has not changed. Um, but if you're worried about the 10 day rule, then um, we understand that we will be asking students to be home at different times throughout the year. So that component has been lifted for this school year. Thank you so much. Um, so we have put together some of the resources shared here tonight and you will receive those via email um, and also text message if you included your text, um, your cell phone number when you register for this webinar. So immediately after this webinar, we'll follow up with the link so you can give us your feedback on this filling up a survey. We wanna know what other topics you would like to hear from us and um, Finally, we want to share another opportunity for you to learn about the processes for lunches, busing, and more. If I can get this next slide, please. This Saturday, there's going to be a live broadcasted Back to School Expo on the district's Facebook page, as well as live stream on the district website. The English version begins at noon and the Spanish version at 1.15 p.m. We wanna thank you for your time tonight and we hope that you will join us on the next month for our next FAST webinar. If I can get the next slide, please. We might not have a next slide, uh, but the webinar is September 16th, so mark your calendars. And we want to say, we'll see you on, Mar on September 16th again at 6 p.m. And uh, for now, that's all we have for you. We wanna thank you so much for staying with us until the end. And we hope that this was a valuable uh, session for you. And please watch your email and text for the links for the survey and the resources. Thank you very much.